you. Okay, just uh, I'll, I'll start with some of the housekeeping rules. Uh, welcome to the Data Governance Act and Data Driven Policy Making webinar. Uh, we'll talk about impact and practical implementations. My name is Marike Willems from Trust IT. I uh, lead the dissemination and uh, impact on uh, the Policy Cloud project. Uh, and in this capacity, I'll be moderating this, uh, this webinar. Um, some housekeeping rules. Uh, you are uh, in um, mute uh, mode uh, so that we can give the speakers uh, the full attention uh, in, this, um, in this webinar so that they can speak, they can show their slides. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A uh, uh, part, which is at the bottom of the, of the platform. Uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. If, not, we, if there's no time to answer them, we'll obviously come back to them uh, through, uh, through some communications. Thank you. So why this webinar? Um, the proposed regulation on European data governance will foster the availability of data for use by increasing data, trust in data intermediaries and strengthening data sharing mechanisms across the, uh, across the European Union. Um, Policy Cloud, Cyber Watching, DUA and Urbanite, the four projects that have joined forces in this webinar, uh, invite big data and cloud uh, solution providers and policymakers from industrial, commercial and public realities to an expert briefing on the perceived scope of the Data Governance Act. So the implications for cybersecurity and GDPR and the practical ramifications for public and business administrations. So this is what this is why we're doing this webinar today. So the Data Governance Act. Uh, so this is uh, this is obviously uh, a quote by the Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton, uh, back in November 2020 already. Uh, this is where we want to highlight the fact that the Data Governance Act is obviously a part of a set of bigger measures uh, of the 2020 strategy for data, which is aimed at putting the EU at the, at the forefront of the data uh, empowered society. So what we want to highlight here is that it enables trust, it facilitates the flow of data across sectors and the member states. Uh, it puts those who generate the data in the driving seat and, men, and not to forget industrial data in our economy is, is at the forefront here. Uh, for Europe to become world's number one uh, data continent. So these are the four projects, Policy Cloud, Cyber Watching, DUA and Urbanite that bring this webinar to you. Policy Cloud, I'll very briefly uh, uh, present them, but I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll learn more about them in this webinar. So Policy Cloud will harness the potential digitization, big data and cloud technologies to improve policy modeling, creation and implementation. Cyber watching is a, is, a, is a CSA, so it's the European Observatory of Cybersecurity and Privacy Research and Innovation and promotes the uptake and understanding of cutting edge services emerging from research and innovation initiatives across Europe. Then DUE uh, is changing the public sector policy creation landscape through the Digital Twins Initiative. Uh, Pavel will talk more about that later, uh, which leverages high performance and cloud computing to place citizens at the forefront of urban decision-making. So again, policy-making citizens and the data, their data are very important here. Urbanite will facilitate urban traffic planning using disruptive, disruptive technologies such as AI to inform data-driven decision-making in the public sector and along the mobility and urban transformation value chain. So this is the agenda what we're looking at. So point one we've done already now. Uh, then uh, we'll follow up now with the, with the second uh, presentation, introduction to the DGA and the policy cloud legal and ethical framework for data-driven policy making. This will be brought to us by Alberto Gattiol and Martin Taborda, Taborda from ICT legal, uh, in, uh, legal Consulting and the Policy Cloud Project. Then we'll be, uh, this will be followed up by the DGA and the cybersecurity and privacy implications for policymakers, public administrations, research projects, and SMEs by Paolo Balboni, also from ICT Legal. Uh, and then, from, for, uh, then afterwards, we'll look into some practical implementations that will be presented to us by DUE and Urbanize, uh, by both by Pavel Kogut and Sergio Campos. And then we'll close this webinar with a roundtable discussion where we invite also you to provide your questions through the Q&A uh, so that our, our experts can answer this. So now I um, would like to stop sharing my screen. So I would like to invite 
uh, Alberto and Martin to start sharing their, uh, their uh, slides so that I can briefly present you. So Alberto Betio is a parking at, uh, partner at ICT Legal Consulting, a compliance and legal expert specialized in privacy law, compliance systems, anti-money laundering, countering, counter financing of terrorism and compliance audits. And Martin Tobarda Barata, also a partner at ICT Legal Consulting, is a legal consultant specialized in intellectual property and information law. He manages privacy and data protection compliance strategies for global multinationals, businesses, and European agencies. Thank you, Alberto and Martim. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marieke, and uh, good afternoon to all the attendants uh, to this webinar. So uh, the presentation that uh, I will share uh, along with my fellow colleague, Martin Tabor de Barata, relates to a general overview of the Data Governance Act and uh, its uh, impact on the policy cloud project, uh, uh, specifically with regards to legal and ethical aspects of, the pro of this project. Okay, so starting from uh, the examination of the DGA, uh, the starting point is that on uh, November 25th last, uh, the EU Commission issued its proposal for a Data Governance Act. This proposal is the first of a set of measures announced in the 2020 European Strategy for Data. Uh, this instrument aims to force uh, the availability of data for use uh, by increasing trust in data intermediaries and by strengthening data sharing mechanisms across the EU. This regulation will also support the setup and development of common European data spaces in strategic domains involving both private and public players in the field of health, environment, energy, agriculture, and obviously in the public administration sector. Uh, regarding the, the approval process, uh, the DGA must be debated and negotiated by the European Parliament and the Council of the EU before it is adopted. Once adopted, uh, it will enter into force after one year and it is directly applicable in all EU member states. Regarding the expected benefits of the DGA, uh, this initiative aims to make more data available and facilitate data sharing across sectors and member states to leverage the potential of data for the benefit of European citizens and businesses. Uh, just to make uh, a few examples on uh, how the, the DGA will, will benefit uh, in, the, in, the life of, in the everyday life of, Europe, of European citizens. Uh, good data management and data sharing will enable industries to develop innovative products and services and will make uh, many sectors of the economy more efficient and sustainable. Uh, and it is also essential for the development and the research and development activities related to AI technology, artificial intelligence. Uh, therefore, with more data available, the public sector can develop better policies, leading to more transparent governance and more efficient public services. Also, data-driven innovation, as anticipated, will bring benefits for companies and individuals by making our lives and work more efficient, uh, for example, in the field of, of uh, healthcare, because uh, it will lead to the improvement of personalized treatments, providing better health care and helping cure rare or chronic diseases. It has been estimated that uh, uh, the implementation of the DGA could lead to savings uh, uh, up to approximately 120 billion euros in the EU health sector. Also, uh, another relevant uh, sector in which uh, the DGA will will have a strong impact is the sector of mobility because it has been estimated that uh, it will lead to a saving of more than 27 million hours of public transport users uh, time and up to 20 billion euros uh, a year in labor costs of, uh, of car uh, drivers uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other workers in the mobility sectors. 
Furthermore, obviously, it will have a, a strong impact uh, in the public administration data, which is uh, the one uh, on which uh, uh, the policy cloud project focuses, uh, because it will um, enable to deliver better and more reliable official statistics and contribute to evidence-based decisions. Stepping forward to the key measures, the key measures, uh, measures of the DGA, um, the, the chapter of the DGA introduced mechanisms to facilitate the reuse of certain public sector data that cannot be made available as open data. For example, the reuse of health data could advance research to find cures for rare or chronic diseases. Um, the DGA also, introduce, uh, also introduces measures to ensure that uh, data intermediaries will function as trustworthy organizers of data sharing or pooling within the common European data spaces. Also, the DGA introduces measures to make it easier for citizens and businesses to make their data available for the benefit of society. Finally, uh, the DGA introduces measures to facilitate data sharing, in particular to make it possible for data to be used across sectors and borders and to enable the right data to be found for the right purpose. So um, for the analysis of the impact of uh, the potential impact of the DGA uh, and its relations with the policy cloud project, I will leave the floor to my colleague Martin. Okay, thank you, Alberto. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Martin Tavarda Barata, and uh, my part of this presentation is going to be looking at what are some practical implications that the DGA might have uh, to a project such as Policy Cloud. As Marika explained right at the start, uh, the Policy Cloud project essentially aims at helping um, policymakers, be these public administrations or in, a few, in future scenarios, businesses to make decisions around policies which are based on data. So the, um, let's say, consumption of large amounts of data to better draw patterns from those data and make decisions for policies which are based on evidence and more objective uh, approaches to policy making. So the DGA affects this project um, in several different ways, but we could look at two main categories of services which Policy Cloud is offering to understand how Policy Cloud can be affected by DGA and uh, what, what we need to consider in the future. So the two main categories of services that we're going to be looking at are the tools that Policy Cloud wants to offer to policymakers for data-driven policy development, the platform that Policy Cloud wants to create for the exchange of data sets, policies, algorithms, and analytic tools, also known as the data marketplace. And we will also touch on chapter four of the DGA on data altruism because uh, this possibly has some impact on uh, another service of policy clouds known as incentives management. And it's generally just an interesting topic to talk about. Um, moving ahead, chapter two of the DGA, it, it's relevant for policy cloud indirectly, but it would be mostly relevant for the policymakers that want to use policy cloud in order to process data from the public sector. As Alberto mentioned, the DGA is introducing conditions or the possibility for public sector bodies to define conditions for reuse of their data. Um, so this is, of course, for data sets which aren't uh, entirely open to the public already. So the public sector bodies can define conditions for their data to be reused by data users. As long as those conditions are made publicly available, they don't discriminate and they're proportionate and objectively justified. Among these conditions, they may require, for example, data users to only handle pre-processed data sets. So they can say, a data user can make use of our data set as long as we have anonymized it first or pseudonymized it first or redacted confidential information from it. They may also require data users to only access public sector data within restricted and secure processing environments. So these might be processing environments that you can access remotely or you might have to physically go to a data set under the public sector body's control. And obviously they can charge fees for this if they wish. Furthermore, public sector bodies will have a level of control over the results or, or be it what is done with the data of theirs that is reused. 
they can create restrictions on use of results which contain information that affects third party rights or interests in a negative way. Uh, the flip side of the coin is if under applicable data protection laws or other laws, there's a need to obtain consent from individuals or permission from organizations to reuse public sector data, the public sector bodies will need to find ways to assist data users in obtaining this consent and these permissions. And finally, there are restrictions on the possibility to allow data users outside of Europe and outside of the European economic area to make use of public sector data. Chapter three of the DGA creates restrictions and conditions on any organization offering data sharing services. And this is a, cha a chapter that more directly applies to Policy Cloud uh, from the perspective of the platform that I mentioned, the data marketplace, where Policy Cloud is looking to act as an intermediary between data holders and data users and between data users um, for the exchange of data policies and uh, tools to analyze data and further develop uh, data-based policies. So this part of the DJ applies to the provision of data sharing services, and this includes intermediation services between data holders and data users. That also includes any, any system such as a data exchange or a platform or database enabling the exchange or joint exploitation of data or results obtained from those data. One key requirement for these service providers is prior notification. So it's not that you need to register with an authority before you can provide the services, but you do need to uh, notify them that you're going to start providing these services. And the notification requires the provider to uh, offer uh, you know, a bunch of information about who they are, where they're located, and what types of data they are going to be handling. After notification is completed, these services can be offered in all member states. So you don't need to notify once per country, you can notify once for the union. If you're already providing these sorts of services when the DGA comes into place, you will be given a transitional period to uh, complete these notifications. And then um, having notified, you can start providing these services, but you're restricted in several ways on what you as a provider can do with the data. So one key restriction is if you're a data sharing provider, you are not allowed to use the data that you share for any purpose other than to make it available to data users. So you literally have to act just as a platform or as an exchange. So this means that these services need to be provided by autonomous or independent legal entities. You can't have the same entity providing these services and using data for their own purposes, they would need to create a, you know, an independent spin-off to be able to do this. You can collect metadata on the use of your service, but that can only be used for service development. For particularly, you can't use it to advertise or target users with uh, other data sets that you might like to sell them. You can have a procedure for access to your services and you can charge prices for access to your service, but the conditions need to be fair, transparent and non-discriminatory. You need to exchange data in the format in which you collected it from the holder as a rule. There are some cases when you can convert formats for interoperability purposes, for example. And uh, from the security and uh, access control perspective, uh, you need to have measures in place to ensure reasonable service continuity, abuse and fraud prevention, security, and that if you become insolvent, uh, your data can still be accessed by the uh, users who have an interest in accessing it namely data subjects for their own personal data and companies for their own uh, corporate data. There will be uh, authorities appointed to ensure monitoring of compliance with the DGA and they can issue sanctions or require the cessation of or postponing of services in case of a breach. Very quickly to touch upon data altruism. Data altruism is basically the practice um, of offering your data voluntarily for a purpose of the common good. So you can have data altruists who are individuals and you can have data altruists who are companies. And a data altruism organization will be a company or rather an organization which is not for profit, which has been created to collect these data that individuals or companies make available voluntarily to meet some sort of a, you know, common interest or purpose for the greater good. Now these organizations can operate outside of any notification or re registration system, but there is a voluntary registration system in place which if complied with lets an organization refer to themselves formally as a data altruism organization recognized in the union. These organizations will have record keeping and annual reporting obligations towards authorities about what data they handle and what use has been made of their data by data users. They have information obligations towards the data holders. This means the persons or companies from which they collect data. They have obligations to limit the possibility for reuse of the data that they make available. 
and um, authorities will be appointed to ensure monitoring of compliance and the commission will be working on developing a data altruism consent form as a standard form to collect a legal basis for use of these data. And that is about it. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Alberto. That was very interesting. Um, while Paolo Balboni is setting up his screen, I will uh, briefly present him. So Dr. Paolo Balboni is, a fund, is the founding partner of ICT Legal Consulting. He is a top tier European ICT privacy cybersecurity lawyer for multinational companies. He's a pro professor of privacy, cybersecurity and IT contract law at the European Center on Privacy and Cybersecurity. Uh, and also at the Maastricht University Faculty of Law. And he's a member of the UMETSAT Data Protection Super Supervisory Authority and the lead auditor of the BS ISO. Um, and a very complicated name, uh, IEC uh, 2013. Uh, thank you, uh, Paolo, for joining us. Um, there's one th um, administrative matter that I would like to mention. I see that there's a hand raising of uh, Luliana. Uh, if you have a question, please put your question in the, in the Q&A. We'll certainly get back to this uh, in the panel discussion. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon also on my side to all the participants. Um, so I'm here on behalf of uh, the EU uh, Horizon 2020 project uh, uh, Cyber Watching. Cyber Watching uh, is, uh, as it was presented before, um, um, an observatory. So we observe, uh, analyze, uh, and cluster uh, more than 175 uh, uh, European projects that have to do with uh, uh, privacy, data security, and uh, cyber security. Uh, within our mandate, uh, uh, we also um, manage a marketplace uh, with uh, more than 50 uh, product and services developed by research and innovation projects that are uh, most of them freely available for uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, for other research um, institutions uh, or uh, for public administration. Uh, in our project, uh, we also uh, recommend uh, uh, standards, uh, policies, uh, procedures, uh, best practice, uh, again, on privacy, data security and cybersecurity. In my presentation, I will try to address uh, how um, our uh, EU observatory through uh, the numerous projects that we are mapping and the numerous uh, services available on our marketplace can actually um, help um, the uh, DGA uh, in its uh, potential future uh, application, especially with respect to uh, public administration, uh, small and medium enterprises, research and innovation projects uh, and policy makers. So immediately we observe that the DGA is not um, a legal source, uh, a proposed legal source uh, uh, that is a standalone, but it's in a um, um, uh, nice company um, of other legal sources uh, with which needs to integrate, uh, collaborate, uh, and uh, um, actually um, make sure that there are no uh, conflicting provisions and they are all complementary. Just to mention some of them, the Open Data Directive, uh, in the sense the DGA is uh, um, you know, addressing data held by the public uh, sector. Of course, the well-known uh, data protection, uh, general data protection regulation and the privacy directive and forthcoming uh, regulation in terms of you know, general use of personal data and use of personal data by electronic means. Um, but on the other side, uh, what we need to observe is that the DGA will actually uh, impose quite, sig quite significant duties and obligations uh, um, on data security, on confidentiality, on integrity, on availability, on member states, and especially um, public organization, public administrations, uh, in terms of uh, deploying privacy enhancing technology in exchange of, uh, in the exchange of uh, personal data, uh, in terms of using anonymization or pseudonymization or encryption. 
So these are, of course, uh, all obligations set forth in the proposed DGA on uh, member states and public administrations. So as my colleague said before, the DGA aims at releasing, um, uh, unleashing uh, the potential of data and therefore um, together also with the general data protection regulation and uh, with the e-privacy directive and regulation and the open data directive to foster the circulation of personal data in order to extract the value both from the society and for the economy. The idea therefore is to make uh, data from the public sector available for reuse and uh, um, by um, uh, businesses, uh, think about in, the, in our case, uh, our stakeholders, uh, small and medium enterprises or research and innovation um, projects. But the whole point is that more data will be circulating, more data will be used. And um, there is a very interesting uh, uh, study from the OECD uh, data 2019 that is just uh, about uh, addressing uh, risk and benefits of data sharing uh, and data reuse across society. And you know what? One of the main concern is about data security and cybersecurity. Because the more data we have, the more confidentiality breaches uh, may, uh, we may come across. Um, we may have uh, an increase of data breaches, which is uh, you know, loss of confidentiality, integrities, and availabilities on personal data. Um, we may um, exponentially multiply the cyber attacks because uh, more data are managed by different uh, entities. Uh, um, more interesting, these are potential targets for um, cyber criminals. Uh, not to mention, of course, also intellectual property rights related matters that falls out of uh, uh, this scope. So we go now to um, the specific role of the member states uh, in security, especially with respect to public administration, but also competent uh, uh, body supporting uh, uh, the, public, uh, the public sector and the public body. As I mentioned, um, it is clear also in recital six and recital 21, uh, sharing personal data under the DGA will entail an obligation for member states uh, related to the security of those processing and also the deployment of state-of-the-art techniques, including um, privacy enhancing technology like anonymization, pseudonymization, and so on and so forth. So, here comes uh, um, cyber watching with a call to the regulator um, in the sense that as we sometimes listen, we witness in the EU um, scenario, in the EU panorama, is that there are already a lot of solutions um, created you know, with the funding of the European Union that are not very well known. And therefore, this is also one of the objective of the cyber watching to create this observatory in order to make more prominent possible interesting solution. So when we look, for example, at our projects uh, um, that we uh, feature in, uh, in our uh, marketplace, we see already uh, a number of very interesting projects in order to assure confidentiality, to ensure data security, uh, as an example of uh, privacy enhancing technology. And I want to show you something very interesting. In, in our portal, in the cyberwatching.eu portal, there is this uh, very interesting and handy cyber watching project radar. So if I click here, I just uh, shift to um, this uh, screen here. So you see that I have the radar and I have the possibility, I'm on the cyber watching website, I can filter you know, all the uh, 100 plus um, uh, projects. And I can select, for example, just to see the projects on data security and privacy, as you see the results on cryptography and so on and so forth. Um, Paolo, we can still yeah. see your presentation, not the website. All right, sorry, just a second.
I believe you can now see uh, my screen, right? Yep. Okay, so here you see the radar with all the projects. Uh, here we have the uh, taxonomy, we can filter, you know, depending if we're looking for uh, cryptography or let's say data security and data privacy, we apply the filter. So here and here immediately you will see the cluster in different domains, security of systems or cybersecurity governance with different maturity level. The green is the higher maturity level. And then immediately you will try, you, you can find the potential products or solutions already available uh, on the EU marketplace, uh, also in order to help uh, you know, uh, public administrations and member states, and we will we'll see also at the later stage, small and medium enterprises uh, in order to secure that new data flow that will be generated by um, the DGA. So coming back, to the presentation. So this was the call for um, the um, regulators. Um, uh, here um, on um, uh, small and medium enterprises, of course, we observe as the, how the DGA uh, can uh, you know, improve the access uh, to the value of big data in terms of uh, uh, you know, getting more information, getting more analytics, uh, uh, reduction uh, in time to market uh, for, uh, you know, startups. Um, but again, especially startups, they don't have enough uh, resources in order to comply with data security, privacy, and cybersecurity, and the cyber watching and the radar on the projects can be very meaningful for them. Last but not the least, uh, uh, the impact of the DGA uh, for uh, research and innovation projects. Uh, so it is uh, uh, quite clear that uh, um, this uh, act will stimulate uh, research and innovation, making available more information for analysis and to develop more data-driven uh, research uh, and advancements. Um, but again, the key point is to make sure that also in this RNI projects, uh, enough cybersecurity and data security will be there. And once again, the cyber watching portal can help with uh, uh, already existent uh, possible solutions. So I stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, we now continue with two very short presentations on the practical implementations of the DGA uh, for data sharing in data-driven uh, policy making. Uh, the first of the two uh, is given by, Paul, by Pavel Kogut. Pavel, while you're setting up your, uh, your presentation, I'll briefly introduce you. Um, Pavel is a researcher uh, in 21C Consultancy. Uh, he's an experienced researcher, project manager, and training facilitator specialized in the use of data and new tech to drive insights for improving government, government services. And he's going to present the practical implementation implication for DUA. Thank you, Marieke. Thank you, Marieke, and uh, hello everyone who is on the call today. Great to see so many people interested in the topic. So yes, I'm representing the DREAC project here and the practical implications of the legislation that we're talking about today for uh, digital twins. And if we look at the objective and the aim of the legislation, uh, we certainly see it as an opportunity for us as a project where we try to build digital urban twins uh, for three different locations in Europe, Flanders, Athens, and Pilsen in the Czech Republic. Uh, but also this legislation can be, be beneficial for other digital twins in other sectors such as healthcare. And this text that you see here was taken from the impact assessment that Paolo just referenced. And, uh, if I replace the word intervention here with the digital twin, then we have a, a very similar objective that we actually try to achieve in our project. So specifically uh, in GIET, we try to use digital twins uh, so that um, data can be leveraged and policymakers can, can use the insights from, uh, from this data to implement uh, data-driven decisions that can then be beneficial to society as a whole. And there are some fitting references in the documentation to connected factories, to the Internet of Things. Uh, so uh, I think um, the Commission was thinking something along the lines of digital twins, although it didn't say exactly that digital twins can directly benefit from the legislation. Uh, very briefly, I would like to say just a few words about um, what we mean by digital twins. There have been a lot of discussions and um, certainly digital twins is a buzzword these days. 
with many definitions available. I'll just put it simply that digital twin is a digital representation of uh, something, something physical. And um, because of that, digital twins are essentially an approximation of reality. They are a simplification of reality that can be improved if you feed it uh, uh, enough data. And assuming that this uh, data is of a certain quality and that you have uh, the necessary computing power to process it. And the fact that the um, Data Governance Act is going to make uh, more data available, data that comes from different sources, different sectors, data that is trusted and is interoperable, is certainly a positive sign. And in our project, we um, are using data that doesn't just come from public sources, but we're also using data from private providers. Uh, and also in, in the future, our intention is to use data coming from citizens themselves um, in, in the form of citizen science data. Uh, as digital twins um, of smart cities uh, tend to take data from multiple sectors, uh, so you obviously need data from a key areas such as mobility, environment, energy. Healthcare is not directly related to smart cities, but uh, it's um, mentioned quite often in the legislation, and I will briefly talk about that. Um, the issue of trust uh, was emphasized quite a lot in the, in the legislation, and I, I will um, uh, give an overview of some use cases emerging use cases from the digital twin world where more trust more trusted data can certainly uh, can certainly bring certain benefits in specific instances and um, uh, with regards to data sharing uh, it's very important for example for digital twins that the models that are used to simulate the reality are able to exchange data between themselves in our case, for example, um, we have air quality models and, and traffic models. So uh, especially with regard to policy simulations, you want to, um, you want to know what changes, um, uh, what changes in, let's say, traffic um, uh, can have an impact on changes in air quality or noise pollution. So that, that is one specific example of why it's important to have data interoperability between various models used in a digital twin. And uh, in, the, in the next few slides, I would like to give an overview of some use cases uh, where uh, digital twin enabled innovation uh, can, um, uh, can deliver specific benefits to decision makers and society as a whole. I will start with mobility because I think in mobility you have a lot of established use cases that have been uh, have been proven in uh, multiple uh, contexts. Uh, what you see now in front of you is uh, is an integrated mobility model um, uh, called City Flows uh, from the uh, city of Antwerp. And the advantage of this model is that it uh, combines multiple data sources. So you don't have um, just data from uh, traffic sensors, uh, but you also have data from CCTV, from Proximus, which is uh, a telecoms provider, also data from traffic lights. Uh, and so on and so forth. And um, some examples of how this data has been used uh, include um, emergency services. They can use this data to plan operations. Uh, also, this data can be used uh, uh, by private businesses to plan investment decisions and private companies uh, in logistics sector, for example, to uh, plan, plan their um, uh, scheduled deliveries. And, and now I would like to talk a little bit about health, because as I said, um, the European Commission emphasized health a lot in the legislation. Uh, and uh, so far uh, in the digital twin world, we, we had some limited use cases uh, that show us the potential uh, of uh, health data uh, and how it can improve actually a patient's well-being. And uh, several years ago, uh, Siemens presented the so-called uh, multi-scale uh, personalized uh, physiological model of a heart and um, they were able to create a digital heart using uh, data from medical um, uh, records from ultra scans and other images they were also able to mimic the heart's uh, motion um, uh, mimic the heart's ejection fraction dimensions and then they were able to test uh, different therapies on on that heart and pick the treatment that uh, best corresponds with the with the patient's well-being so here, here we have a, a very specific example of how a digital twin that um, uh, is using health data can uh, deliver specific benefits to, to citizens. And if the trust issue is resolved, uh, then we may also be able to see more human-oriented digital twins uh, 
uh, human oriented digital twins um, uh, have also been quite limited up until this point and uh, they were used uh, mostly in the airport design in um, countries in asia and the middle east and the idea there is to use biometric data provided by um, citizens through wearable devices and smartphones, combine it with um, uh, pedestrian flow models and some tracking technology to assess how people experience their built environment. And um, of course, in Europe, uh, it's a bit more difficult due to the privacy concerns involved. So if, if the trust issue is resolved, uh, as a result of the Data Governance Act, we may uh, see more human-oriented digital twins in Europe that are not only used uh, for airport design, but um, we can easily see them being used to design stadiums, design shopping centers, uh, public spaces like museums, and so on and so forth. And the last uh, use case I would like to uh, talk about is the digital twins at higher scales, uh, because there are some references in, in the supporting document accompanying the legislation references to cross-border services and of course everyone probably has an example of the sort of cross-border services that can be created as a result uh, but in a digital twin world this is already happening we are seeing aggregation of digital twins at higher levels in the united kingdom they're experimenting with this thing called a national digital twin where they try to connect multiple systems uh, such as mobility energy uh, and, um, uh, and infrastructure objects across uh, the four different countries. So Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So to conclude, um, I'd just like to say that we are cautiously optimistic about uh, the Data Governance Act because um, it has um, many objectives that are directly uh, relevant and related to digital twins. So making data more interoperable, um, increasing trust in data sharing and in, in improving the reuse of data. So this is all very relevant for digital twins, but um, questions uh, do remain with regards to data spaces. How are they going to be organized? How uh, exactly this altruist organizations will function? And um, will there be any new standards? Because we already have quite a few standards um, from different organizations. Uh, there are the minimum interoperability mechanisms by OASC. Uh, there's fireware standards, OpenGS spatial consortium has standards. So remains to be seen what kind of standards um, may be introduced as a result. And last point, um, I think this can actually work both ways. I think that uh, the, the legislation can certainly support the development uh, of and the adoption of digital twins, but it can also work the other way around. I think as um, uh, people learn about benefits of digital twins, as we publish more success stories of uh, digital twins, the public um, uh, will be more eager to, to accept the legislation and be more eager to share data if they see how this data can benefit them directly. So this is really all I wanted to uh, share with you. If you want to know more about the GF, please uh, visit our website. So this is all Marieka for me today. Thanks, Pavel. Thank you very much for these uh, to give us an overview of the DUA practical implement implementations. Um, so we move on to Sergio Campos. Sergio, can you uh, start sharing your screen while I present? Well, I'll briefly present you. Uh, on you, the heavy task to kind of keep it a bit short so that we can still answer the questions from the audience. Um, so Sergio Campos Cordobes, he's project director at Tecnalia. He's a senior researcher and project manager focusing on data-driven methods, architectures and services to support planning and operational aspects of urban mobility. Sergio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but I think uh, the presentation is still is uh, uh, in uh, not not yet in presentation mode. Oh, okay, sorry. What's happening? Maybe you're sharing the wrong screen. Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, but your presentation is not in presentation mode. It's in PowerPoint. Okay. Now? Perfect. Yes. 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 Sorry. Very sorry. 
So let me introduce briefly the, the Urbanite project. This is an age 2020 uh, project. We are in the uh, 10th year of the, the executions. Basically, our object is matched uh, uh, with the general idea of, of, the, of the meeting today, because uh, our main objective is the, the adaptation of data driving and evidence base decision making in the urban transformation and more specifically for uh, urban mobility. The idea is to focus on the on the user. Uh, for us, the main user is the, the public servers. But we want to analyze the, the, the aspects related to the adoption of the technologies. Uh, more, uh, some of the aspects are subjective, but the idea is to focus on the in confidence of this kind of technologies and uh, when we are covering the big data that analytics and simulation among other technologies and uh, just to put an example of the use cases we are going to to support the sustainable mobility urban plan from the definition of the urban plan the a prioritization of the different activities and finally to monitoring the uh, the, the challenge and the successful of the these uh, analysis some assumptions for example we need to uh, use data for a better decision making we want to also to engage the citizen and civil servants in a policy making that uh, to work together and finally to provide uh, a guide guidelines for uh, a better adoption and implementation of this kind of technologies as results, we have three main uh, results. The first one is to put in uh, the setup of uh, cooperation environment, uh, uh, working groups, and supporting a platform to, uh, to uh, provide co-design and co-create uh, policy uh, design, uh, data management plan, uh, platform to gather the information and aggregate this data and provide this information for external use and also to provide some um, <coughs> advanced data uh, data analytics algorithms and simulations and, and a giant for recommendation for the cities just uh, a brief review of the different regulation that we are uh, uh, managing in the project for sure the the main one is related to the uh, gdpr uh, we separate two uh, we have three steps or iteration in the projects. The first one is more focused on the open data that is currently available in the, in the municipality and the management of all the information that we uh, uh, re, uh, manage in the recruitment and the participation of the different uh, stakeholders of the municipality. For the second and the third steps, we want to manage uh, information collected for third parties and aggregated in, in our platform and also to exploit the potential of existing personal data uh, that uh, currently uh, many uh, municipality many pilots are having in internally the second uh, regulation that is important for us is the the ethics guidelines for uh, artificial intelligence provided by, by the uh, european commissions and we adopt some of the, the, the different requirements uh, uh, shown in, in these guidelines in the terms of act actionability, because we consider that we want to define new models and new algorithms to, to deal with data, for sure ensuring the, these ethics criteria, and we identify some relevant requirements at the usability, the confidence on the prediction, the interpretability of results, the self-sustainability of the, of the models and the scalability. The idea is to, to avoid to block uh, boxes and to provide a more uh, transparent uh, picture of the different to ensure the, the trust and the confidence of the, the users that uh, are providing data for us. Specifically, if for Data Governance Act, we consider that is a, a new legal framework for sharing data that is very important because we need to 
uh, and gather information for uh, third parties, external people, but also it's important to share information among different public authorities. Uh, in mobility, uh, we have uh, a complex governance model involving different uh, uh, administration at different levels, uh, regional and also uh, functional levels. So the opportunity to share information also in, in, in the public sector is, is very important. Uh, for sure, more available data, better policies, um, better efficient um, public services in here in, in the mobility. And we want to explore which is the relationship between the different frameworks, legal frameworks, because we consider that we uh, have several uh, aspects that we want to, to go in detail. This is the, our first analysis, because I mentioned before, at this moment we are dealing with uh, um, open data, data, but the next step is go to include also personal data and, and data from third parties. For our uh, social uh, policy lab, that is uh, the common picture of the uh, two discussions, we want to put in common the new regulation for the, for the technical point of view, we want to explore how can we extend our platform to manage uh, data governance, uh, manage the regulation, manage the, the ownership of the data. And finally, we want to explore um, specifically for data analytics, some specific techniques of uh, federated machine learning and transfer optimization because we want to explore uh, how can we uh, uh, take advantage of the sharing uh, uh, partial models of the different cities to upper levels? Not only exchange uh, experience, but also to exchange models to support uh, more advanced uh, prediction and, and decisions. And this is all for, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio. So um, while we, I'm going to launch the first question that is asked by the audience already to the panel, uh, Judy, can you, can you uh, launch the poll so that we also know who, a little bit more about the people that are on the call at this moment? So um, the, the first question that you see there, there is, which stakeholder group do you belong to? So please, we invite you to, to take part in this poll. Meanwhile, um, there is a question by George Kambanis, and he's asking, as a data marketplace with a focus on mobility data, are there specific new legal developments or certifications that we should investigate? Who wants to take this question? Can we please try to answer it in, in less than a minute so that we can still address the other, yeah. <laughs> the other questions? I can, I can take this question. Mary. Thanks, Martin. Um, so as we discussed briefly in my presentation on chapter three, of the DGA, there are going to be specific requirements applicable to platforms such as data marketplaces, which in the regulation are referred to as data um, sharing providers. Uh, and so these requirements will include the prior notification requirement and the several restrictions that I mentioned, such as the restriction on reuse of the data for purposes other than making it available to data holders, the need for appropriate security measures in place to ensure resilience, data availability, security, and so on. Uh, so that part was covered in, um, in the section on the chapters of the DGA applicable to data sharing mm. providers. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Julie, I think uh, we can see now who's on the, on the, on the webinar as well. So 24% is from industry and 42% uh, is from research and academia. They're very much represented in this webinar. And there's still one more question for the audience. Maybe, Julie, you can take them to the next one while we proceed with the next question from Volker Beckman. So concerning data from the public sector, the DGA seems to aim rather at public administration data than at public research data. So do you see a significant impact of the DGA on the way the huge amount of public research data will be shared? So who wants to take this question? Yeah, I can take it. Um, I think um, we shouldn't look at the DGA as uh, the legal source to um, you know, unleash the uh, power of um, you know, research data. 
Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the DGA is, uh, is uh, uh, quite clear um, in that, um, uh, uh, in the text uh, uh, in, in itself. Um, I'm uh, uh, looking at the um, text uh, right now. I think uh, if you look at provision uh, um, uh, 3.2c uh, of the DGA, um, you understand that there is an exception for uh, what they are called uh, um, educational establishments, and if you if you read this uh, also in uh, in combination with the recital eight, uh, seems that this is not really the purpose of this legal source. I think it's uh, uh, then more the purpose of the combination of the Open Data Directive uh, and and the General Data Protection Regulation and uh, possible other um, uh, legal uh, means at the member states uh, level. Thank you very much, Paolo. You're welcome. Um, I see there's also a question from Luliana Litu. Um, so she's asking, so besides, uh, the res besides restrictions in data formatting to ensure as much security as possible, are there also restrictions on types of applications that this can be used? So she says that, that her intuition is that many hackers will attempt to connect them with already known uh, data and reverse engineer for instance, so also given the heterogeneity of the data, will there be also directions on how to potentially handle this heterogeneity? Who, who would like to take this question? Well, if you want, I can take also yes, this one. Um, it's, um, uh, it doesn't seem to me that uh, the DGA uh, goes uh, uh, so much into, into the details, uh, but there is uh, a more general call in uh, establishing an adequate level of uh, uh, data security, data protection, and also um, cyber security when it comes down to um, uh, information uh, more generally. Uh, so therefore, I try to stress the point in, um, in my presentation that uh, one thing that uh, really need to be thought through, um, you know, in this legislative process is, um, you know, are all the questions related to Cyber security and data security. That uh, this additional source enabling, you know, the flow of data and the reuse of data, is actually uh, posing. And I, I mentioned also the 2019 OECD study, which I think is quite interesting, also in this respect. Thanks, Paolo. Is there anyone that wants to add anything to this? Thanks. No. So sh then there is a very interesting question by Liliana Carillo. Um, so the question is on, on one of the presentations. So um, I think it was on your presentation, Martim. It's uh, what is the strategy to attract individuals and organizations to become, to become data altruist organizations? Um, so I think one core, um, one core point is that data altruist organizations will be the organizations themselves, the not-for-profit bodies that collect data from individuals and organizations. So the data altruist organizations work with data altruists who are individuals and organizations that make data available. The organization is collecting that data and then uh, offering that data to other users that may want to use it for, uh, for a certain purpose. So the strategy to attract organizations to become data altruist organizations or for those organizations to be created is uh, basically it's more that the DGA creates rules under which these entities can operate and how they can register to you know gain a, the use of a formal title uh, of acknowledgement within the union to improve their standing and trustworthiness among uh, the altruists that might want to give them data. Um, generally, this is the point. The, re the regulation creates um, a, a mechanism through which these organizations can become uh, more known and gain some form of, it's not really a certification, but it's a title that they can use uh, to appear more trustworthy in the eyes of people who might want to offer their data, people, organizations. And then those organizations, the DAOs, will have their own strategy to create incentives for individuals and companies to share their data for a common good purpose, for research or, or any other purpose that might be defined in the public interest. Thanks, Martin. Pa Pavel, do you want to add anything to this? I think you're muted. From the uh, DUA perspective, yes? 
And uh, no, I just I just saw there was a comment uh, or question about uh, digital twins. So yeah, th there is yes. So there, uh, when digital twins are mentioned, does this refer to city twins derived from the sum of other twins? So devices twins, personal twins, organizational twins. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in our case, we we were quite specific because we wanted to focus on on three key areas that that uh, we think are important for smart city. Uh, so environment, uh, mobility. Uh, and, and air, air, air noise pollution, uh, and uh, we have uh, specific models corresponding to these three areas, and the models exchange data between themselves, so changes, for example, in traffic are automatically calculated, and um, um, changes in, in air quality and, and noise levels are computed automatically using high-performance com uh, computer. Uh, but I know that other digital twins, they, for example, uh, fo were focused more, let's say, on energy, and they had semantic models that showed on a 3D map different buildings that um, that showed uh, energy use, energy levels for, for specific uh, buildings. And they were simulating, for example, um, uh, uh, the possibility of mounting solar panels on different buildings. So I guess it, it depends uh, on, on your interest, on the specific policy issues that you're trying to address. Um, but I think it's important that um, the models are loosely coupled and that there's just a, a central data broker that can connect multiple models um, and you can sort of plug and play and experiment that way. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, I see there's also uh, a question uh, from Rick Schager. Um, so I think, Alberto, this is, this is one for you. Uh, is the DGA directly applicable? So is this without local or national artification? Yeah. Ratification, uh, sorry. The, yes. Since uh, the instrument uh, chosen by the EU is uh, the regulation, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, directly applicable uh, into all um, member states of the Union, uh, there will there will be no need for uh, uh, for specific uh, ratification laws uh, and, uh, and acts by uh, each member state. Uh, it is the Similar approach that uh, has uh, has been recently uh, chosen by the EU with regards to the data protection, uh, in which we switch from the data protection directive of '96, uh, which was uh, uh, deployed in several different ways in uh, all the member states, uh, to the general data protection regulation that uh, uh, enables a consistent <laughs> application of the. Of the of the law uh, among all countries. Thanks, Alberto. Thanks. Um, so I've seen that uh, will the DGA have an impact on your work? Uh, most of you on the call uh, say yes, and some of you are still a little bit unsure of how that will work. Um, so I would like to close the webinar with the last question. Uh, we would have loved to answer more. But uh, we're we're uh, we're pressed for time, so I would like to invite you to join all the projects communities uh, for their updates uh, on social media, on the websites. Uh, and we're now going to close off with this last uh, this last question. And I already thank you for all for for joining this webinar. Uh, so, could or should reuse of the controlled data be overseen by a third party instead, or in addition to data providers? <coughs> Excuse me. This could prevent possible misuse of results from the second party by the first party data providers. Who wants to take this one? Um, hi, I can, I can give some insight on this. Uh, so the Data Governance Act is not going to replace other types of uh, EU legislation that, that are in place, such as the legislation on trade secrets, intellectual property and personal data, for example. So it's not that because data is made available <clears throat> to data users for reuse, that they can reuse this data in any way that they want without paying attention to legal obligations that apply to them. So we have uh, the DGA creating the possibility for public sector bodies regarding public sector data to control uh, the reuse of their data to an extent and also the results of those data. But we also have the GDPR creating restrictions on what data users can do with personal data. We have trade secret directives creating restrictions on what can be done with data that might include trade secrets. We have intellectual property rights creating limitation on what uh, can be done with intellectual property right protected data and so on. 
So, uh, and these um, legislations in themselves, including in particular the GDPR, have other supervisory authorities that are competent for monitoring their compliance. So the reuse of a data set involving personal data, for example, will involve the authority behind uh, monitoring the DGA where it comes to monitoring the performance of the data sharing provider. It will involve the public sector body when it comes to their own abilities to monitor the use of their data and results. And it will involve the data protection authority where the data set itself includes personal data. So uh, this is an example of where the reuse of data may trigger other legal obligations, other uh, supervisory authorities may be involved to monitor that reuse. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, who have been uh, sharing your expertise and your insights into the DGA uh, on, this, uh, on this webinar. Thank you very much, Alberto, Martin, Paolo, Pavel and Sergio. Uh, it was really interesting to see uh, what the Data Governance Act uh, will, uh, will bring us. Uh, and how how these projects uh, can help policymakers in uh, in complying with uh, with this act. Um, so it rests me to say uh, that if uh, that the slides and the recordings will be made available. Uh, and thank you very much for joining this webinar. Uh, have a good thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Bye bye.